So I will um, get started. So I will give an overview, and then Joe will take over to describe how we made the encyclopedia. So in case you have not heard of the ENCODE consortium, um, the whole name is the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And this is a group photo of um, the consortium um, at the end of phase three. Um, this was at Salk, Lake, uh, Salk Institute. And uh, as you can see, it's a pretty big consortium. So what do we do? We have a few goals. Um, the first one is we aim to catalog all functional elements in the human and mouse genomes. And also we want to develop freely available resources for the research community. And we want to study human as well as um, mouse and other model organisms. Um, ENCO used to have um, worm and fly in the past. And at the end, we want to uh, produce components through data generation, data analysis, and repository so that our results will be able to benefit the broader research communities. So um, here is a brief history of the ENCODE project. Um, it started out um, in 2003. It was a, a pilot phase. And then phase two, phase three, so pilot phase was using microarray. And uh, phase two started to use whole genome sequencing. Phase three just finished um, a few months ago. Phase four, we are in phase four right now. Um, it started in February of 2017. So um, in order to um, be a good re community resource, we aim to do a few things that um, make it um, usable for the community. First is we want to, re we rapidly uh, release all the data pre-publication. And uh, the data are released through the encodeproject.org, the encode portal. And as soon as a data set is deemed quality, of high enough quality, is released uh, through the portal. And the second is um, we want to make all the software tools and analysis pipelines open source. And we put them at the GitHub and so that um, anybody can download uh, freely and use them. So we have also worked very hard to establish data standards, quality control metrics, and anal analytical tools to make sure we can evaluate the quality of each data set and then flag them if um, some data, data sets may have um, issues with any of the metrics or standards. So today um, we will talk about ENCODE Encyclopedia, which is a compilation of the results that um, we obtain from analyzing ENCODE data. So um, being a community project, we really care about um, how how useful the data are. So um, NHGRI, um, specifically Mike Payson, uh, a program officer at NHGRI, spends lots of time cataloging how many papers um, cite ENCODE data. So here is a graph separating the papers into two groups. One is um, in blue is uh, publications by ENCODE members. And then in red are publications by outside non-ENCO members, but outside community. So as you can see, um, um, more and more um, outside users have started to find, find the ENCO data uh, benefiting their research. So what kind of publications use ENCO data? So here is a breakdown of around um, 1750 community publications using ENCO data. So you can see that um, a huge chunk of them uh, use ENCO data to try to understand human diseases. And uh, roughly the same number use ENCO data to understand basic biology. And then also um, a sizable number use ENCO data to develop novel methods and uh, software. So because the number one um, 
application of ankle data is human diseases. Um, that's why we come here and uh, hope to um, facilitate this application. So you can see these kind of all kinds of diseases, cancer, um, autoimmunity, neurological, uh, human genetics diseases, and cardiovascular. So um, that's why we're here. Here is the website for the ENCODE portal I mentioned before. So everything we produce is freely available through uh, ENCODEproject.org. So um, there are a few advantages of working for a consortium. And uh, the first is um, the data sets. There are lots of data sets and they are publicly available. So um, we have access to them also um, inside the consortium. And uh, we try to coordinate the data production efforts so that um, many assays are performed on the same set of cells and tissues so that it's, um, the data sets are, are nice and neat so you can perform more easily integrative analysis. If you use public data, they might be hodgepodge of different cell types and different numbers of assays, um, not as uh, easy for integrative analysis. And also, um, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, defining and implementing uniform data processing pipelines and also quality control. And then the data coordination center um, spends a lot of effort to collect um, and curate, uh, make sure they are correct, the uh, metadata for ENCODE data sets and also standards. So all these ensure um, uniform processing and uh, um, accurate metadata for integration. But also, um, being a consortium, um, um, it's a little bit different from um, doing individual uh, research lab kind of projects because a lot of the decisions are made by um, working groups. We call them working groups. So um, how do working groups decide things? They get on a phone, and so we have lots of conference calls, and you can see. And sometimes um, it's good and bad, and you can um, voice your opinions if you want to um, play a bigger role in a working group. Um, but it does take time to get on those phone calls and then um, contribute. So what's new in ENCODE 4? So there are a couple of new things uh, for ENCODE 4. One is um, we um, now um, we, we, we can take uh, samples from the community and then process them through um, the mapping centers and then also the characterization centers and then produce the data and then feed into the whole uh, corpus of ENCODE data. That's one thing new. And then the second one is we will aim to uh, take also the community data from outside ENCODE and then go through the data coordination center, um, try to also add them into the uh, ENCODE collection. So um, unlike previous ENCODE phases, um, before we did not have characterization centers. Now we have a, a whole set of characterization centers. And uh, the new uh, the mapping centers, here are eight mapping centers and the, the PIs and the kind of data they produce. Each of them produce different kinds of data. Um, the characterization centers include these five. I think there are three additional ones that have been approved. Um, I haven't added them to this list. And as I mentioned, um, I'm co-leading the data analysis center with um, Mark Gusting from Yale. And the data coordination center is headed by Matt Cherry from Stanford. In addition to um, these um, centers, um, there are also computational analysis projects um, that are um, um, more loosely connected with data production, and there are six of them for ENCODE 4. So um, I, let me summarize a little bit about uh, phase three ENCODE data production. So I mentioned that um, you can go to the ENCODE portal, encodeproject.org, to get all the data. I just want to also mention that um, the epigenome uh, roadmap project, which has ended all the data are also uh, available on the ENCODE portal. So in total, 
um, there are um, 9,000 uh, data sets in ENCODE. And uh, during phase three, um, we produced uh, close to 4,000 data sets on humans and uh, just about 1,000 data sets on mouse. Also, um, there is a collaboration between ENCODE and uh, the GTEx consortium. Um, so we um, collect human tissue samples through the GTEx route and then process them in ENCODE. So there are four donors, um, two males, two females, and then multiple tissues, as you can see in this matrix. Um, one thing about the mouse co component of ENCODE 3 is um, um, Bing Ren's project uh, from UCSD um, and his, um, his team members, um, several other universities included, produced um, harvested mouse tissues across developmental time points from embryonic time 10.5 to um, adult and then also across tissue and this is um, pretty good because um, these kind of tissues are difficult to obtain for humans. So each um, of um, this tissue was um, assayed by eight histone marks, DNA methylation, whole genome by self-I sequencing, and RNA-seq. So this is a pretty rich data set. And also, um, Grant Gravely's project worked on RNA binding proteins um, they had a multi-prong approach. Um, they performed B-clip data for a large number of RNA binding proteins in two cell lines, K562 and then HEPG2. Um, this is a, a liver a hepatocyte cell line, and K562 is a red blood cell derived cell line. And they also uh, performed um, 70 RNA bind and seek in vitro experiments to determine the binding uh, specificities of each RNA binding protein. And then they performed root seek um, for over 30 um, RBPs across three cell types. And you can see um, here is a genome browser shot of their data, of their eclip data for the RBP, RBFOX2. And then here is the input, so you can see the signal is much over input. So I think, um, so that's kind of an overview, and today we will focus on the ENCODE Encyclopedia. As I said earlier, it's, it's like a summary of all the analysis results. So you can imagine um, all the raw data are deposited into, actually everything is deposited at the ENCODE portal. So all the raw data are submitted to the portal, and they get run through uniform processing pipelines, and then the pipelines output um, a bunch of um, things. For example, for DNA-seq data, you will get DNA hypersensitive sites. For histone mark chip-seq data, you will get PIGs, and so on and so forth. For RNA binding proteins, we just mentioned, you also will get PIGs. And so these um, outputs from the uniform processing pipelines uh, constitute the ground level of the ENCODE Encyclopedia. So today uh, we will uh, focus on a particular component of the integrative level of the encyclopedia, which is called the Registry of Candidate Regulatory Elements, which is more an integration of all these um, data, raw data and uh, the ground level annotation to produce regions in, in the genome that are candidates of regulatory elements. So some of them are like promoters, some of them are like enhancers, some of them are bound by CTCF, um, some of them are target genes, and so on. And we have also uh, custom-made a uh, visualization tool called Screen that will be able to display the registry and then also the underlying data. So next, Joel is going to talk about how this registry is made. And after that, Michael will uh, have a live demo about how screen works and make sure you get on the Wi-Fi so that you can uh, follow along um, about the tutorial on screen. 